Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We started this long story tonight. We have a little time together. Uh, we're going to complete that study in Colossians chapter 3, and we'll uh, do just a little review from last week, and then we'll pick up in a new area. So let's begin tonight with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your presence with us tonight. We pray, Lord, that we might uh, glean things from your word tonight that might equip us to better serve you and others. And so we just ask that you'll uh, give us uh, wisdom and understanding into your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we talked about look out, and uh, we were uh, especially focusing on on Colossians 3, verses 5 through 9. So we'll read that real quickly. He says, Don't be controlled by your body. Kill every desire for the wrong kind of sex. Don't be immoral or indecent or have evil thoughts. Don't be greedy, which is the same as worshiping idols. God is angry with people who disobey Him by doing these things. And that is exactly what you did. When you lived among people who be behaved in this way. But now you must stop doing such things. You must quit being angry, hateful, and evil. You must no longer say insulting or cruel things about others and stop lying to each other. Paul just gives some uh, very practical advice about things that we need to rid ourselves of and things that we need to take on in Christ. Now, Colossians 3, 5 says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. You know, the Old Testament says, be careful, sin is at the door, and it's like a crouching tiger. It's ready to pounce. And so Paul is really echoing the words of the Old Testament, saying, be careful, watch out. In Romans 6, 1 and 2 that we read last week also, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, or the King James, I like it, it's translated, says, Heaven forbid, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And so, and I, I'm asked this question often, that since you believe in once saved, always saved, what about the person that goes back to their old life? Well, the thing is, either they were not saved to begin with, or they just tasted the gospel and it's like Paul describes some people that get into heaven, but they still have a, a smoke smell on them. In other words, they just escaped the flames. And so we need to understand the seriousness of sin. We talked a little bit about Phineas in the Old Testament who witnessed the plague that God had sent upon the Israelites. And the Israelite men were taking the... the people of other religions and those who worship false gods, and they were taking them as their sex partners or some cases as their wives. And Phineas saw a man who took a Midianite woman into a tent uh, for the purposes of having sex with her. He went in and took his spear and ran it through both of them. And the Scripture says that as soon as Phineas did that, the plague that God had put upon His people stopped. Because you see, Phineas took sin as seriously as God did. And so in a sense, God honored him for the, uh, uh, for the stand that he has taken. Paul echoes throughout the Scripture about the seriousness of sin and especially how sexual sin can be so damaging to the individual. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, we read this also last week. Don't be immoral in matters of sex. That is a sin against your own body in a way that no other sin is. You surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit is in you and is a gift from God. You are no longer your own. God paid a great price for you, so use your body to honor God. I worked with teenagers for about 16 years, and I can't tell you how many times I heard a teenager say, it's my life and I'll do what I want. Well, if you've given your life to Christ, it is no longer your life. It certainly is no longer your body because God paid for it with the price 
that Jesus paid at the cross. We also talked a little bit about in Galatians 6, 7, where a man sows what he reaps. And in Romans 1, 24, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Sometimes God will just turn people loose and allow them to sin until they get sick of it, until they come to that place where they no longer want to have it in their life. And then God is able to do something with that person. Now, I talked last week about my cousin Kenneth, and that's, I think that's where I left off. My cousin Kenneth and I would go out at my granddad's farm in Yukon, Oklahoma, and we would hunt. Uh, not that there was any wildlife in danger of being killed. Uh, we couldn't hit anything. But we still enjoyed walking out through the fields. And one day we were with our old dog, Pat. And Pat had suddenly disappeared into a hole. And all we could see was his tail sticking up and hear muffled barking inside that hole. We grabbed old Pat by his back legs and pulled him out. Both of us looked inside the hole. We saw a black and white tail go up and then sound, and then we were covered uh, with a skunk scent. And my grandmother didn't have to ask any questions as to what happened. Whenever we walked in the house, she said, Ooh, Lordy, you boys take off those clothes. And he said, and said, meet me by the fire barrel. And she burned our clothes on the spot. Uh, we had to get rid of that stink. And what Paul is saying in Colossians is that the stink of sin is upon us. And what God wants us to do is to strip off that old, that old clothing, that old way of living, and put on the, the new uh, clothing that uh, Christ has provided for us. And so, so again, let me talk a little bit about this list of things that he says to take off. Just And that's literally what it means in the Greek. It's talking about uh, stripping. It's talking about taking off clothing. And so he says, first of all, to get rid of anger. And anger is a continuous attitude of hatred that remains bottled up within. You know, and when a person doesn't deal with anger properly, it boils up inside of them until finally they just blow up. Uh, tonight, uh, our kids at Awana are going to have a lesson on anger. And as I was doing research for a counseling time that I have with them, I ran across a story of... Uh, uh, Zinedine uh, Zendane, uh, which is, who is a French soccer pro player, he was considered at one time probably the, the greatest European soccer player and most certainly the greatest French player to have ever played the game of soccer. Uh, he had retired from soccer, but then the 2006 World Cup, uh, invited him to, to come and be a part of the French team. Now, he had been away from the sport for two years, and he was 34 years old, which is a little old for a soccer player, and so he went ahead and entered the competition. He played like a, a youth. It was amazing. He, uh, they, in the France's second-round match, they went up against Spain. They beat them. Then they went against highly ranked Brazil, and they beat them as well in the quarterfinals. And uh, then they played against Portugal and won that game by a penalty kick. And so now they went to the World Cup, and they were playing against, uh, uh, against uh, Italy, their arch rival. And so Zendani, they, they felt like that because he was playing at such a high level again that they were almost assured of winning the World Cup. It's the most coveted title. During the game, though, Zendani lost his temper. Uh, I watched the video, and he had just missed a goal, so possibly he was a little angry about that. He was walking towards midfield when an Italian player by the name of Marco Matarazzi he came up next to him. They exchanged words. And then 
uh, Zendani turned around to him, faced him forward, and headbutted him right in the chest. Hit him so hard it lifted the man off the ground and he fell flat on his back. Well, you can imagine if you're a soccer fan or you follow soccer, you know what happened next. The referee came to him after a short time of deliberation and gave him a red card. He was kicked out of the World Cup final. His team went on to lose that. There was such a poignant picture to me as they showed him walking out of the stadium. He was unwrapping the tape, and he walked past a small staging area that had the World Cup trophy sitting upon it. And he didn't even look at it as he walked past. The thing is, is the greatness of this player is now forgotten because of that loss of temper. Because he allowed anger to overcome him and it possibly cost his team winning the prize. Anger is something that we all experience. And the Bible doesn't say that anger is already always a sin. It says, be angry, but sin not. And so we need to learn to control our temper and not allow anger to have, have a, a foothold in our life. Paul also talks, though, about rage. This is something that just comes bursting out. It, it comes almost uh, out of nowhere, and it's where the person becomes uncontrollable, where they just cannot uh, get a grip on their feelings and their actions. Malice also is an attribute of ill will towards a person. It's often Malice is often kind of a hidden hatred. And again, it's one of those things that bubbles up inside a person. And oftentimes, it leads a person to take revenge in secret. Slander. And I think this can be almost as damaging as any of the other sins that Paul mentions here. Slander is when we destroy another person's good reputation by lies, by gossip, and the spreading of rumors. Uh, I remember years and years ago, there was a story that I, ta that I had read, and it's an old, old illustration, where a man had started a rumor about the preacher in town. And that rumor just spread like wildfire. It was untrue. But yet people listened to it and they heard it. And one of my favorite phrases is, you can't unring a bell. When a person hears a story, and even though they may know in their heart that it's untrue, it's just still so doggone juicy, you've got to share it with somebody else. And it destroys the person. Well, this gentleman, once he realized his sin about the rumors he had spread about this pastor, he went to his home. And he said, I am sorry, I know that I have damaged your reputation, and I hope that you'll forgive me. The preacher said, you have my forgiveness. But let me show you something. And he went back into his home, and he brought out a pillow. And he tore off one end of it. And he shook it out to the wind, and the feathers just scattered everywhere. And the pastor said, I forgive you. But if you'll wait two days and come back, I want you to gather every one of those feathers and put them back in a pillow because, you see, the lies that you told cannot be brought back into the pillow, back into, uh, into right standing with many people in this community. And, folks, I'll tell you, I, I believe that especially in a small town, because uh, I've lived in a small town before, and, and we're in a small community here in Picture Rocks. Once a rumor begins to spread, it can, it can rob a minister of the opportunity to minister. Someone says, if you're having problems, why don't you go talk to Pastor So-and-so? Uh, he could probably help. Now, I've heard things about Pastor So-and-so, and so no, I'm not going to go talk to him. And so it, it limits ministry. Slander can be so dangerous. We must put that away as a part of our old life. Also, filthy language, crude talk, abrasive words. It, it's, uh, it's also often filled with sexual innu innuendo and swearing and things such as that. 
heard someone say just the other day that a very crude word that is very popular in our society today, well, it's just a word. I want to remind you that whenever the people were trying to find things about Jesus the night before he was crucified, and whenever the uh, Peter was approached and they said, aren't you one of the disciples? Aren't you one of the twelve that follows Christ? He said, no. A second time when he was approached, again, he said, no, I am not one of his disciples. But the third time that he was approached, the Scripture points out that he swore, he cursed, and said, No, I am not one of the disciples. And the thing is, and at that time, the rooster crowed. The thing is, is that our speech reveals our heart. Once that person who was accusing him of being a follower of Christ heard him swear, in a sense, that settled the matter. He must not be a disciple, a follower of Christ. And I'm telling you, it is so very important that we be careful about our language. I can give a personal illustration. A good friend of mine that I grew up with in Bethany First Baptist Church, his name is Dale Allen. And Dale still lives in Bethany, and he lives just within a block or two of of our church. Dale had taken a job at Wiley Post Airport there uh, in in Oklahoma City, it's uh, one of the at one time was one of the largest small airports in the country. And Dale worked there during the summers uh, when he wasn't in school. And I worked there kind of as a favor to him. I think I took his place on the job and worked there a little bit whenever I could as a line boy. And I remember as the guys that had worked with Dale as much as two years earlier. They, they said, you know Dale. And I said, Dale and I have grown up together. They said, you know, it's really weird. The whole time that I worked with Dale, nearly two years, I never heard him use a bad word. I never heard him curse one time. Now listen, friends, people notice the kind of language that you use. It tells where you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Filthy Language needs to be put aside. The other thing that he mentions is lying to one another. What lying to one another does, besides the deception associated, it also disrupts unity, especially within a church, within a home, and it can tear down relationships. It Lying will always, always lead to serious personal conflicts. And so... All of these behaviors that Paul lists here are behaviors that should have no place in the life of a Christian. Uh, The things that he talks about here, uh, that's a part of your skunk clothes. Those need to be burned. It needs to be done away with. Again, words reveal the heart, so we need to be careful. And so we've already talked uh, then about look up and look out. And uh, the next section we want to look Look in. Um, and so we look at Colossians 3, 9 uh, through 10, and um, we, we recognize the truth about what happened the moment we received Christ. Look at 9 and 10. You have given up your old way of life with its habits. Each of you is now a new person. You are becoming more and more like your Creator, and you will understand Him better. And so, in other words, he's saying that you've taken off your old self. Now put on the new self in Christ. One of my favorite verses that's always been a challenge to me in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I don't have it on the PowerPoint, but, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so the thing is, we have been created in the image of God, and as we begin to mature and grow as a Christian, we put off those old bad habits, and we put on good new habits in Christ. And so much so that we begin to look like Jesus. The people can tell that we have been with with Him. Warren Wearsby puts it this way, He said we were formed in God's image and deformed from God's image by sin. But through Jesus Christ, we can be transformed into God's image 
once again. I love the story told about a new missionary that was going into an area that hadn't had a missionary in years. And the missionary that had previously, some 10 to 15 years earlier, uh, had not ever been able to be replaced. And so this new missionary was on the field. As he was going to the people and trying to get to know the people better and introducing himself, and they were, he was telling them about Jesus and describing the way Jesus treated people, the way he loved and the way he cared for the people. At first, the natives in that village just simply did not understand who he was talking about. They, they couldn't grasp the concept. But as he described more and more about the love and the care and the service and everything, they said, oh, you mean Brother Smith. And that was the name of the former missionary. What a great testimony for us that whenever people are describing Jesus, it sounds like they're describing you and me. And so that should be something that we shoot for. That should be our goal, that we, uh, that we look like Christ. And so... How do you do it? It, it? it happens by transforming your mind. Look at Romans 12, 2. Paul says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I feel like I kind of missed out. We had some cool toys when I was a kid, but nothing like what kids have nowadays. And I think I would have really gotten into Transformers. I just think it's really cool that you can have this car and then make a couple of, of, of changes on it, and all of a sudden you've got a robot. And I just think that's really cool. And the thing is, is uh, we're to be Transformers. That means that we become a totally different person than what we were previously. That happens whenever we begin to change to change our minds, to think rightly, um, put your mind on things that are heavenly, not things that are earthly, Paul says. And so uh, we, we, look, we look in, but then also and lastly, we look around. Uh, the best way for you and me to break free of our past, we must look around and see other people as Jesus sees them. Colossians 3.11 it doesn't matter if you are a Greek or a Jew or if you are circumcised or not. You may even be a barbarian or a Scythian. And you may be a slave or a free person. Yet Christ is all that matters and He lives in all of us. In Christ, there are no barriers. In Christ, it's not nationalities, it's not race, it's not gender, it's not all the things that it seems today like divide us. Christ is all that matters. We've, we've had arguments and there are debates over Black Lives Matter and things like that. The Bible is very clear there in verse 11, yet Christ is all that matters. And if we are rightly related to Him, all this peripheral junk that's going on uh, uh, will, will just simply break down and go away. The gospel breaks down the walls that separate us. I still believe one of the dumbest things I hear over and over and over again, and I'm sure I've even said it myself, it is our diversity that unites us. No, it's not. It is our unity that unites us. And I'm telling you, I, I heard a gentleman the other day on the news, and I wish I could remember his name right now. I can see his face in my mind. But he said on national news now, he said, we used to identify ourselves in two categories. You were a believer or you were a non-believer. And he said that was the way we defined ourselves. And he said now... We have gotten things so distorted that we're breaking down so many different kinds of classifications that uh, it, it's, it's just building walls between one another. I learned a new word the other night. I hope I don't get to chasing a jackrabbit here, but I was reading an article about a situation about transgender and this and that. And I heard of a young college student in Ohio 
that was, well, he was fearful because they were bringing into the college dorm rooms brand new radiators to keep the building warm, okay? He was concerned because the, the workers appeared to be cisgender. Now, that is C-I-S-G-E-N-D-E-R. Cisgender. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm right on the pronunciation. I had to look that up. I had never heard of that term. It is the opposite of transgender. It is a person who believes in and supports uh, their their birth sex. And so this young man was afraid of people that were heterosexual, that were truly male because they had been born that way. And so they identified that way. So that was a new one on me. There are so many walls up between us today. And again, I, I agree so much with that commentator that I heard the other night is that, you know, we really should define our identity by being a believer in Jesus Christ or we are an unbeliever. Instead, we, we focus on racial distinctions and um, the spread of the Greek culture could make a person who was Greek feel proud and uh, privileged and they would look down on the Jews. A Jewish person, on the other hand, would regard Gentiles as heathen and immoral. After all, they were God's chosen people. And so anyone that was outside the Jewish faith, they were outside of God's grace. We also divide ourselves today by religious distinctions. Uh, in the days of Paul, it was the false teachers that were saying it's not enough just to believe in Christ, to be baptized, but you've got to be circumcised also. And over and all, over, Paul says that um, surgery didn't give anyone an advantage over the other and where their standing was in Christ. Cultural distinctions. The Greeks considered any non-Greek to be a barbarian, uh, to be a barbarian, and uh, the Scythians were the lowest barbarians of all. And as a matter of fact, they looked at Scythians as being just a little bit lower than beasts. And that was their their economic dis distinctions. We certainly see that today in our culture. Uh, we have our ruling class now in America. Those that are. You can call them the establish, uh, establishment or the elitist or whatever, but they believe that they're on a level above everyone else and they don't have to obey the mandates or the rules that they are often instituting themselves and it causes great division and especially upon those people who consider themselves free. And that's what we've been known for in America. And so some of the new ideas that are being introduced in our society today are very unwelcome. So the thing is, these human barriers that have been construction, uh, constructed, Paul is saying that's a part of the old life. Put it aside. Get rid of it. In Christ, we look at a person and see that they have a need for a Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no distinction about their color. There's no distinction about their economic status. There's no distinction about what country they're from. They are a person in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, we really need today, folks, to embrace that above everything else. Tonight, you know, boy, we've been overwhelmed here at our church here re recently by illness. But I, for those that are in our church that uh, are listening tonight, really and everybody else too, stop looking down. Just stop looking down. Look up to God. Stop searching for something that will never satisfy. Look to God. Uh, only Jesus satisfies. He is the only one who can bring about the peace and comfort and joy to our hearts that I believe Nearly all of us seek today. So seek Christ by looking up. Live Christ by looking out, by looking in, and by looking around. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity to share from your Word. Uh, Father, I, I just pray that as we uh, open your Word each Wednesday night, that it will come alive, that we'll understand that these things that were written nearly 2,000 years ago have as much application today as they did the day they were written. And so we thank you for your Word, that it's alive, that it's powerful, it has the ability to change lives. And I just pray, Father, we won't look at your Word as a, a, a rule book that's meant to crimp our style, to give us a buzz kill, but rather, Father, I pray we'll look at your Word as a, your love letter to us to tell us how much you love us. You loved us so much you gave the very best of heaven. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that he might purchase a place for us in heaven that He might provide forgiveness of sin, and not just forgiveness of sin, but removing the guilt that is associated with our sin. We just thank You, Father, that You've covered all the bases, and we pray, Lord, that we will live lives full of victory, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, we will always look forward to, to being a part of your Wednesday nights, and we're very grateful. God bless.